Well, welcome uh, to this presentation of the Iron Brigade evacuation from Antietam, from the Antietam battlefield. Uh, we talk about two of my favorite things. Uh, number one is the Iron Brigade because it's from the Midwest and we're only eight miles from Wisconsin. And there were three regiments from Wisconsin in the Iron Brigade. And the other one was from Indiana. And then also we're gonna talk about my favorite battlefield, which is Antietam. Uh, why do we love Antietam so much? Well, it's, that and Shiloh were the two most uh, pristine battlefields, I think, in the Civil War chain. So, and then it's, it's, a, it's important to me because the system of evacuation that was started in August of 1862 by uh, Letterman uh, got its baptism of fire at the, at the Battle of Antietam when you had 23,000 casualties and they had to, and some of them had to be moved off the battlefield. If we go back a year or so uh, to the Battle of Bull Run, 1861, 1862, Second Bull Run, uh, casualties were laying on the battlefield, some up for two or three weeks uh, before they could get any help from anybody. Uh, and now uh, due to Dr. Letterman, Jonathan Letterman, who was medical director of the Army of the Potomac, uh, who got the job in July of 62. And he had stuff, one of the main things he set up was an evacuation system uh, where the soldiers knew uh, that there was somebody going to be there to pick them up and get them into a hospital environment uh, expediently and uh, they wouldn't be suffering on the battlefield. So that's why I'm in, really interested in these two subjects. Uh, number one, the uh, evacuation, and all number two is. Uh, at Antietam. So we're going to take you through that and we're going to talk about the Iron Brigade. Uh, the Iron Brigade was also known as the Black Hat Group, the Black Hat Brigade, Iron Brigade of the West, and originally King's Wisconsin Brigade. As I mentioned, there were three Wisconsin units, the second uh, Wisconsin, sixth Wisconsin, and the uh, seventh Wisconsin, and then the 19th Indiana was, was thrown in there. Uh, when it was set up, when uh, Governor uh, uh, in Wisconsin set it up, he wanted to make it all Wisconsin, uh, but uh, he wanted to put the fifth Wisconsin in there, but some kind of, something happened in Washington, and uh, so uh, it didn't happen. Uh, that was Governor Randall uh, of Wisconsin, and so they got the three Wisconsin and the one Indiana, so basically it's a Midwestern unit. Uh, the nickname Iron Brigade with its connotation of fighting men with iron disposition was applied formally uh, to a number of units in the Civil War. Uh, uh, there was one from New York uh, and my friend Lance Hurtigan, who's done most of the work on the Iron Brigade, uh, he calls it, that's the cast iron brigade. So uh, he's got another name for it, but we have the Iron Brigade of the West is what we're gonna talk about today. The nickname came also the Black Hats. Uh, we'll talk about the uniform in a minute, but they wore a very distinctive uniform, especially their hat. It was a tall, hardy hat, black. Uh, and when the, vet, uh, the Confederates saw this happening at Antietam, well, they'd met uh, a few weeks before at the Battle of Second Bull Run uh, on the uh, uh, Groveton, or you call Brunner's Farm, uh, where uh, Jack Jackson's brigade attacked the Union and met. Uh, the Iron Brigade, which was brought up at that time, and they took stiff penalties uh, right there. So they, when these two had met before at the Battle of Second Bull Run, and now when the Confederates saw in the beginning of the Battle of Antietam who was marching up to them, uh, and they knew that they were going against veteran soldiers. These were not uh, guys just out of the training camps. So uh, the Confederates knew what was coming after, after them. Uh, the unit... Uh, also, was, as we know, called King's Brigade or the, the uh, Wisconsin Brigade. And uh, it got its name as the Black Hats. Uh, basically, at the Battle of uh, Turner's Gap or the Battle of South Mountain on the 14th and 15th of September, uh, the, the, the Iron Brigade was marching from Frederick uh, up to Turner's Gap uh, to in, get through the gap and then get into Boonesboro and maybe the Sharpsburg. Uh, and they fought heavily up through the road. Uh, and General Mc, uh, McClellan was watching this from a hillside. 
and he mentioned to his brother officer, who happened to be Hooker at that time, uh, he said, who are those men? He said, they're fighting like iron. So the story goes, uh, and Hooker, those are the, mid, the Midwestern men. And that's where the, the name supposedly came from uh, when McClellan saw that and said they fight like iron, but that's up for conjecture, but uh, we'll use it for uh, today's lecture. Uh, okay. Uniform. This is a tin type of a soldier. We don't have the name of the soldier, but uh, you can tell the typical uniform. You look at the hat, it's a tall, uh, hardy hat. Uh, they would have insignia on that hat also. Plus you look at his frock coat. Uh, most of the Union soldiers didn't wear a frock coat. Now the frock coat comes down to mid thigh. Uh, this one should go a little bit lower. And he's got his belt on, he's US and his Eagle uh, breastplate. And then he's carrying a, a cartridge box and plus his, his weapon. Uh, these weapons were the Lorenzo uh, from Austria. And these were, uh, again, single fire muzzle loader. Uh, the, the coat was dark blue. The pants were a light blue. Uh, and they also had a little special, it doesn't show this, but uh, Gibbon, who was now in command of the uh, Iron Brigade, he was kind of a stickler. And he made the men wear gaiters. Now, gaiters were uh, something to put over your shoes and go up halfway to the pants, and they were pure white. And what they would do was keeping the dust and the stones and out of the back, uh, out of the socks and things like this. And the soldiers really hated them. Uh, they, were, they thought that this guy, this General Gibbon, was just trying to do a number on him. But uh, Gibbon was a stickler, and he said he wanted those things clean as the driven snow. And I'm looking out my window right here in Illinois, northern Illinois, and I see a lot of driven snow that hasn't been left yet, uh, hasn't left. But uh, so they wore that distinctive hat, the black hats. They had their uh, coat, the frock coat, the Lorenzo um, weapon, and also they had the white gaiters. Let's go back a little bit and we'll talk about the different wars before the Civil War, the Revolutionary War. We all know it was 1775 to 18, 1782. Uh, 1775, the Continental Congress established a medical service for the Army of 120,000. Uh, director of the General Army was Benjamin Church of Boston. And in 1777, General Washington ordered the inoculation of all recruits for smallpox. Uh, so they saw the problem with smallpox and they wanted to get rid of this by inoculating the troops. Uh, surgical procedures in the Revolutionary War, basic amputations and trephining. Trephining is head surgery where they take out a section of the skull about the size of a dime, uh, getting pressure off the pressure off the, uh, the fracture of the skull. Others, they, they took care of cuts, burns, boils, abscesses, fractured bones, specific conditions, dislocated joints, and gunshot wounds. Uh, battlefield surgery in the Revolutionary War, dress your wounded behind the hill. Uh, regimental surgeons are stationed with their militiamen in a fort, of a, in a fort or in a defensive line. Give emergency care only in the heat of battle. Uh, amputation or capital operation is best to be avoided at, the, at that time. Stop the bleeding with lint, compresses, ligatures, or tourniquets. You remove foreign bodies, reduce fractures, apply dressing, and before the check, uh, before the battle, check with regimental officers for men to be carried off the battlefield uh, in wheelbarrows or other convenient bear, beers. So uh, they, they set up a way of supplying, but it really wasn't working that well. On uh, 1812, basically it was the same uh, during the War of 1812 as it was in the Revolution. Now the Mexican War started in 1846 and lasted in 1848. Now you look at the advances. In the Mexican War, there were some advances. First, use of anesthesia in war. Uh, and that's the biggest misconception that most people have at that time. Of our people today, uh, they didn't have anesthesia. Well, wrong again. Uh, they used ether, which was brought into the mankind in 1847 with an Ed Edward Barton. They also used chloroform and the rank and the status for medical officers. So, medical officers had, had rank. Uh, medical care no ambulances, no organized hospitals. Regimental surgeons traveled with the regiment, no provision to resupply, wounded uh, were treated um, near the front lines at a makeshift hospitals. And this is neat triage. What we all know is triage is sorting the wounded. And they talked about this in Mexican War, triage. Those able to march and those unable to march. So you can see it's not the greatest system in the world. McGuire in the Civil War, 
uh, Hunter McGuire with the Confederate Army's HUD recognition of medical officers as non-combatants. Um, most medical officers never carried a weapon, or if they did, it was a small weapon uh, for their own personal defense. Uh, and they were supposed to be non-combatants. I mean, you, you don't shoot at them. Uh, Letterman, who took over in 62 and 63, makes this statement, humanity teaches us that the wounded and prostate foe is not, not then our enemy. So this tells you that the Union were taking care of Confederate casualties and vice versa. The Confederate uh, hospitals were taking care of Union casualties. And then we, as they started getting war, uh, more generalized, they came with the Geneva Convention in 1864, and it kind of changed the whole system. Johnson Letterman, my hero, born in 1824, died in 1872. He was born outside of Pittsburgh and Cannonsburg. Uh, he was a father of medical supply, a father of triage, good triage, a father of evacuation, and then a system of field hospitals. And at the bottom, you see he had a genius for administration. He was a man uh, set there by uh, William A. Hammond, who was the Surgeon General. They knew each other uh, before the war. And uh, Hammond saw that we needed somebody in the Army of the Potomac who could take over and get it going. And this was Letterman's job. Letterman didn't, didn't uh, pass by. He said, I want to do this, and I'm going to do it my way. And he got permission from Hammond, and they also got permission from General McClellan, who was in command of the Army of the Potomac when he took over. So Letterman was the man who really set up the evacuation, and the Army, United States Army today is still called the, the, the Letterman evacuation system. What Letterman saw when he took over in July of 1862, the Army was just been beaten in the uh, Peninsula Campaign. Uh, the Army was down on Harrison's Landing on the James River. Uh, about 17,000 men were sick. Uh, mainly from scurvy, typhoid fever, you name it, they had it. Uh, and Letterman saw that there was no communication between medical depot and the depot and the headquarters. Supplies were exhausted or destroyed. Hospital tents left behind or destroyed. No proper reports, lack of proper food, inadequate ambulances, inadequate numbers of medical officers. The biggest problem that he found there was scurvy. Uh, scurvy, which we know today is a lack of vitamin C, and it, it, the, it, it attacks the soft body, uh, mainly in, in the jaw. We see it uh, sometimes today uh, when the jaws or the periodontal ligament that the teeth are attached to the bone uh, goes away and the teeth get really loose. Uh, there's a lot of internal bleeding all over the body because of, of lack of vitamin C. And Letterman knew how to handle this. So he goes up and tells Hammond, hey, I need potatoes, I need lemons, I need limes, I need anything that has some vitamin C to it and get it to my army as fast as you can. So they started sending these supplies down to the uh, army on the Peninsula Campaign on the Harrison's uh, Landing and on the James River. And they started moving the uh, wounded off of the area by hospital ships, uh, bringing them up to James River, then around Fortress Monroe, and then up to Chesapeake Bay, and then brought them into Washington, D.C., where their proper hospitals were being established for them. Special Orders 197, August 2nd, 1862, following regulations for the organization of an ambulance corps and the management of the ambulance trains are published for all for the information and government of all. Commanders of Army Corps will see that they are carried out without delay. Uh, McClellan also said to his uh, brother officers, whatever Le Letterman tells you to do, you do it by command of General McClellan in 1862. Now, a lot of people have different opinions of General McClellan, but I'll give him a lot of credit because uh, he saw what Letterman could do. He could see uh, what he was going to help his soldiers uh, by getting them off the battlefield. So this is why he took over this and gave Special Order 147. Start bringing in ambulances. Uh, you can see the Moses. Uh, four wheel, you see the tripler, that was a four wheel. You see the wheeling, that's a four wheel. And you go up and you see the Coolidge ambulance. Now the Coolidge ambulance was a two, two wheel ambulance pulled by one horse. And you can imagine that guy who's in there, he's getting jostled from head to toe, back and forth, back and forth. So the Coolidge ambulance wasn't the greatest. So uh, wheeling ambulance was actually adapted uh, by Letterman and also Hammond when they were both together in wheeling uh, Virginia at that time, wheeling Western Virginia now, and that was made there and it has four wheels, has springs. Uh, it could seat eight people in on a bench and about two or three, if they were reclining, had its own water supply. You had a driver and a helper 
uh, and they were out there pulled by two horses and they went on the battlefield and started picking up these wounded. There's some pictures of ambulances ready to go into action. There's Letterman sitting in front of his tent with his brother, a medical officers. Antietam, 17, September 17th, 1862. Um, Lee made an attempt after the battle of the second bull run uh, to move into Pennsylvania. I think that was his goal was to get into Pennsylvania, maybe bring the war into Harrisburg and bring the war out of the South. But he had to get through Maryland, which he brought across the Potomac River and got into Sharpsburg. Uh, and, but then he had a problem in his rear because Harper's Ferry hadn't surrendered yet. So he had to have a battle or a, a besiegement of Harper's Ferry before he could move. And that gave uh, Letterman or uh, McClellan time to move his army out of Washington, D.C., and they're going to engage in Sharpsburg uh, on the morning of the 17th. You can see on this map, you see the town of Sharpsburg, right? So I'm in the middle, you see the Potomac River to the left, and there's a creek that follows right up along. It's called the Antietam Creek. And you'll see black flags scattered all around the battlefield. Now, those are hospital sites. Uh, the ones on the left of and or west of Sharpsburg are Confederate hospitals. The ones to the right, on the most of them are on the other side of the creek, are Union hospitals. So these were the, the main hospitals that were set up uh, by the two commanders, medical commanders. Uh, Letterman got on the battlefield around the 15th, and the first thing he did was start moving around the battlefield to find uh, places that he could set up his hospitals. Uh, his hospitals, he wanted a good supply of water, either a well or something, a creek or something where they could get a supply of water. Also barns or something like that where they could find plenty of hay uh, and straw so the men could be reclined and comfortably. Uh, his counterpart with the Confederate Army was uh, Surgeon Guild, uh, Lafayette Guild, and he had the same thing with his letter. He went around uh, to the different areas on the other side of Sharpsburg and started setting up hospitals. So they knew there was going to be a great battle there and they're going to need a hospital for the, the care of the soldiers. Now, this is a uh, more detailed map seeing the town of Sharpsburg. Actually, the town had a lot of hospitals in it before and after the battle. Most of the ones before were uh, Confederate hospitals, but after the battle, as the Confederates moved back across the Potomac back into Virginia, then the hospitals in town became the Union hospitals. Uh, but you can see uh, different ones we talk about the Roulette Farm. Uh, the Newcomer Farm, the Sherlock Farm, the Otto Farm. On the other side, you see the David Smith Farm, the Grove, Grove Farm, the Real Farm. These were all hospital sites uh, set up by the medical directors to receive the wounded that they knew were going to happen at the battlefield. After the battle on the 17th, it was a one-day battle. started at 6 a.m., ended at 6 p.m. Um, sun went down, and what do you got? You got casualties. You got killed. 4,000, 6,000 killed instantly. And you got the wounded, plenty of wounded. And you got to get them off the battlefield or get in some kind of hospital uh, system. So this is where the medical corps started working at night. And this was the, the pictures. This was the first uh, battlefield where actually pictures were taken after. Uh, a photographer from Washington came out, uh, sent out two of his subordinate photographers, and they came out and they, were, they arrived on the battlefield on the 18th and 19th and started shooting uh, pictures of, of the Confederate dead and also a uh, Union dead in and around. This is Confederate dead on the Hagerstown Pike uh, as they were trying to get back across the pike and through a fence and they were slaughtered outside of there. Uh, this shows some of the hospitals. Um, after, during the battle or after the battle, both armies kind of looked at each other on the night of the 17th and all day on the 18th. There was not much action. Uh, both armies were slugged out. It was sort of like two fighters had gone 15, 15 rounds and they just had nothing left. So they just looked at each other on the 18th. Uh, Lee wanted to stay. He still thinks, thought he could move on the Hagerstown Pike and move up north into, into uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, his subordinate general said, General, we can't do it. It's, we're army, our army's taking a heck of a beating and we have to maybe get out of here. The same thing with, with uh, McClellan. Uh, his army was bigger, uh, but he was lacking supplies, especially artillery uh, provisions. Uh, they ran out of artillery ammunition. So the, both armies kind of looked at each other on the 18th. They didn't do much, except the uh, evacuation system. You had to 
and Doc, the um, ambulance corps were out on the battlefield collecting the wounded. Actually, there was a truce signed at the Dunkard Church uh, where both armies had white flags and they said, we'll let you work, get your work done and, and we'll work on our side and we'll be have no like, uh, firing at, at what you're doing out there. So the 18th, nobody did anything. Night of the 18th, Lee had enough and he, he did a night retreat across the Potomac River and he went back into Virginia. Uh, McClellan really didn't follow. They had a little engagement in uh, Shepherdstown, Virginia at that period of time. Nothing really happened there except men died uh, cr crossing the river and getting across back across the river. Then that was the end really of the Maryland campaign. Lee went back uh, to Winchester to regroup his army and McClellan set his army up in and around uh, Sharpsburg and other places and tried to get his army back into some kind of shape. These crosses denote different hospitals. Uh, you can see uh, the Bloody Lane here, the Roulette Farm, Kennedy Farm. I don't know if this will work. There it is. There's a Roulette. Well, we'll go back. Okay. Uh, Offenberger. Three Offenberger farms and Rouge hospitals, and these are all Union hospitals on the other side of the creek. And they used two, uh, three bridges to get the wounded over the upper bridge, the middle bridge, and also the lower bridge to get the wounded back across the Antietam Creek uh, into hospital sites. Uh, the Confederates uh, had their ambulances come in, and then they took them out at night and crossed the Potomac River. Oh, it was an evacuation. So now let's talk about the Iron Brigade. Iron Brigade, as we mentioned, 19th Indiana, 7th Wisconsin, 6th Wisconsin, and 2nd. Uh, the night of the 7th, or the 16th, they were encamped in and around the Joseph Offenberger farm, which you see on the top. Uh, they were down in that low area there to the left. And then the, when the sun came up in the morning, they were ordered, they were under General Doubleday, who was a division commander under um, uh, Hooker. And, Hook, and Doubleday told his uh, Wisconsin Brigade and other brigades to move up the Hagerstown Pike and to attack the Confederates, which were in the high ground uh, uh, on the other side. Of it. And there was a cornfield there. Uh, this was uh, the Camiller cornfield, which became very famous with its casualties. So the Iron Brigade was moving uh, through the Poffenberger, through the North Woods, uh, through a field, and then met in the cornfield. And you can see the 19th Wisconsin and the 7th kind of peeled off to the river to the right on the other side of the Miller farm. And then the 6th Wisconsin and the 2nd Wisconsin continued on and they're gonna fight in the, in the cornfield itself. That's a picture we took a couple of years ago about the same time in September. Maybe what the corn was looked like at that time. It was ready to be harvested. Maybe it wasn't as, uh, it was probably more green than that. But, and the corn isn't as dense as what we feel today. Uh, you go out here in Northern Illinois where we live, and you can't, you can't walk through a cornfield and you get lost in it. Here, the corn wasn't planted as dense, uh, but it's ready to be harvested and it's gonna get harvested not the way the farmers wanted it. It's gonna get harvested by the way the uh, uh, gunfire is gonna harvest it. So here are the six Wisconsin and the second are marching. They get through the cornfield. They're fighting in the cornfield against Lawton's Confederates, uh, Grigsby's Confederate, Jones's Confederates, and there's big action. and. In a probably an hour and a half time, there's 8,000 casualties, both sides uh, in that cornfield. So there was a lot of action going on in the cornfield, the bloody cornfield. And you see Phelps, his uh, brigade is gonna come up after the, uh, the uh, Iron Brigade and they're gonna kind of reinforce that. You see a steward over here, that's a, a Union uh, artillery unit. They came across and they're going to put flank fire on the Confederates in that area. And it was all around one farm. This is the farm around in this area. Uh, it was the Miller farm uh, who owned the cornfield. So there was a lot of action between 6.15 in the morning to about 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning in this, in this area. Uh, in the cornfield, uh, the East Woods, and they haven't done the West Woods yet, but it's all around the Miller house and farm. Okay, 6th Wisconsin, 7th, and under Phelps, they're getting beat pretty good and they pull back. They pull back through the cornfield. Uh, 
their sister units, the 19th Indiana and the 17th, and now over in the area, and they moved off the road and they're kind of skirting around to see if they can get on the flank of Lawton and Hayes and some of the Confederates in this area. Uh, Confederate commander in this sector was uh, Stonewall Jackson. Uh, so he, he, had a, he was fighting a good fight in and around the Dunker Church. Uh, you can see the 6th Wisconsin and the 2nd are still in, in, engaged in the cornfield, uh, but they're starting to pull back. They're getting beat up pretty good. Hart Stuff was part of uh, Ricketts Brigade, and he's getting beat up pretty bad. In fact, he gets wounded and moved back. You can see over to the left, you see Stark and Tal Talaferro. They're moving and trying to get on the flank uh, in, the, in the rear of the 17th for the 19th Indiana and the 7th uh, Wisconsin. And there's going to be a big fight in and around this area. And now, who we need some help. Confederates need some help. Uh, they're getting beat up pretty good. And they got reinforcements in and around the Dunker Church. Uh, and that's Hood's, Hood's Brigade or Texas Brigade. Uh, so, and that consists of 1st uh, Texas, 4th Texas, 5th Texas, uh, 18th Georgia, and some from South Carolina. So they're going to attack into the cornfield again. And their job is to break the uh, back of the Union who are in the cornfield and see if they can retake the cornfield. So the 6th Wisconsin and the 2nd Wisconsin are now pulling back because they've been beaten up pretty good all morning long. So here comes Hood's Texans, and they're going to fight in the cornfield. Uh, the 7th Wisconsin and 19th to the left over here are laying uh, flag fire into the Union, or the Confederates in the cornfield. And Stewart, you see Stewart and his Confederate or, or Union artillery, uh, he brings out a section of guns, uh, two six pound Napoleons, and he sets them off here, and they're firing into the cornfield. Uh, so they're firing what we call grape shot or canister into the cornfield and mangling the heck out of these uh, iron or the uh, Texas Brigade. Texas Brigade makes it all the way to the northern sector of the cornfield, but they can't hold, and then they're beaten back. So the Texas Brigade moves back, uh, goes back around the Dunker Church, and uh, General Jackson's back there, and he says to General Hood, uh, the two of them really never got along too well together, but uh, he says, Gen uh, General Hood, reform your, brig your brigade, and uh, re attack again into that corn area. And Hood says, General, I can't. Mine are all dead on the field out there. So uh, Jackson's got to find some, some other help to see if he can get through there. Uh, and he takes some help out of the sunken road, but that's a different story. But you got the six Wisconsin and the second are now pulled back through the cornfield. You got the 17th, seven, 19th Indiana and the seventh Wisconsin over here. They're laying fire in here. And there's a lot of shooting on the left flank over there. Plus, Stewart still has his artillery firing. The Texans are beaten back. And now help comes with General Meade and his, his division uh, brings up the uh, uh, Pennsylvania uh, Reserve Troops, 9th Pennsylvania, 11th Pennsylvania, 12th Pennsylvania, 4th Pennsylvania. And they attack uh, through the cornfield again, and they beat the Texans back and remove them out of the cornfield. Uh, so by Let's say 9.30 in the morning, 10 o'clock, uh, the cornfield is now uh, taken by the Union, and they've moved the Confederates out of that area, and they're pushing back on the other side of the Dunkard Church. Uh, this is a wounded man who's uh, a surgeon, Vandercleef, who was a Union surgeon, performed an operation. Uh, after the battle, uh, the man was a pensioner. They took off his leg, but he, he survived that. And it talks about the, the flap technique that they were using. Now, here's what it looks like today. This is the Miller barn, uh, and this is the Hagerstown Pike. This is the pike right here, and this went from Sarpsburg all the way up to Hagerstown, which is about 20-some miles. So the Union were fighting in around this barn. Headquarters of the Union was at the Pry House, uh, which is still there today, and that was the headquarters for the Union Army and also the Union Medical Corps. And the Spry Barn was used as a field hospital. And this is the area down in here on the night of the 16th, early morning 17th, where the Iron Brigade uh, kind of bivouacked before the battle in this low area here. Now, everybody, if you don't go to Antietam, everybody thinks it's kind of a flat battlefield. Actually, it's very undulating. And so uh, in the morning, 
they get awakened rudely by Confederate artillery who start shelling this area. The men arouse themselves and they get him on and Doubleday gets his men on the road and they're gonna start moving uh, to fight. This is the Hagerstown Pike. Now you can see it, it's up. The, the Confederates are up on the top of the hill up in there. So the Union have to move up this hill on this roadway and they're gonna engage the Confederates who are on to the right and also the front and sometimes to the left. So they're gonna move up a hill. It's not a flat area. Again, that's the Miller Cornfield, uh, Miller Barn. That's the Miller House. Um, you go there today. Uh, Park uh, National Park Service owns these places, and we maintain the exterior. Uh, there's nothing going on inside of these houses, but the, the Miller family was a, a husband and wife and some children uh, living there uh, when the battle began. They had to get out of there real fast because the battle is going to range right around their house. Again, you can see it's kind of a rocky area and the uh, seventh, uh, the, seventh, the 19th Indiana and the 7th Wisconsin are gonna move off. There's a little valley there which they're gonna use to their advantage uh, during the morning battle. Now, here you go, the 6th and 2nd uh, Wisconsin. Now they're moving to the left of the road and now they're going into the cornfield. Now this was taken uh, early in the in June uh, the corners just come up. It's not at full strength yet, but you can see it's a, it's a climb. You got to cross this fence, and then you're moving straight up into the uh, into the uh, part of the Confederate line up in that. Uh, there's the water supply for the uh, house, uh, and then the, the fence. And the it's sixth and six, sixth Wisconsin and second Wisconsin are moving up. And there, this is what it looks like today. There were, these barns weren't there at that period of time. These are all modern. Uh, kind of neat what the battlefield does. It's owned by us as a part of the National Park Service, but they lease out the property uh, to local farmers. Uh, they can have their cattle there, they can grow crops there and things like that. So, so the, the material is not just laying there out dormant. So it's being used at all times. Uh, which is good because it keeps it that way. We don't have housing developments right in the middle of it, thank the Lord. And there's there's the other picture of the uh, uh, Miller farmhouse. Uh, Mrs. Miller had a nice uh, vegetable garden there in front of the other side with a fence, and the soldiers came to and just tore the fence down, tore this garden apart. This was taken after the corn was harvested uh, when I was out there in the, in the fall one year with these pictures. And now you can see. This is what the Union are facing, the 6th Wisconsin and the 2nd. They're moving up a hill into a cornfield, and they're going to meet on the top. You can see a monument over here. That's a Union monument, but that's where the Confederates were wait, lying and waiting for them uh, to come through the cornfield. This is the uh, northern end of the cornfield where the Texas Brigade got, but they're dis disseminated by the time they get there. They get to this fence line and they can't move anywhere forward because Union put up some cannonade uh, artillery up on this hillside here. So they're going to meet that. Uh, these are Confederate cows. Uh, this is the fence line that the uh, Iron or the uh, Iron Brigade was protecting, and also they they met the Texas Brigade here. Now, once they got through the cornfield, then they got an open field here, and their objective, the Union objective, was this white building right here. That's the Dunker Church. And if the Union could get this plateau, this is where the visitor center is today, uh, up in this and take that plateau and put artillery up in there, then they could command uh, the town of Sharpsburg and make Lee move out of the area. So their objective when, when they started off at six o'clock in the morning was to get to the Dunker Plateau, set up artillery on this and move the Confederates out of here. If you go there today, you won't see this. That barn has been demolished, wasn't there during the battle. And a group that I belong to is Save Historic Antietam Foundation. And we buy up this property as it comes up. And then we uh, buy the property and demolish anything that wasn't there during the battle. There's a rocky spine that goes right up to the middle of the cornfield. This is part of it. And it divides the cornfield into two sections, uh, the western section and then the eastern section. The cornfield is about 36 acres at that time. So this rocky spine goes right up the middle of it. Uh, and you can see some men walking along it, but it kind of divides the field and both armies use these rocks and this as a defensive position. Again, going back and then that's the Miller farm. Now, 
Okay. Letterman also found that men needed immediate care and not have to get back to the field hospitals, which were two miles away. So he sets up, he goes out and sets field dressing stations. He sends out a surgeon or two with a corps man. They find themselves a defilade or some protection in this town in this area is where the surgeons, two surgeons were there taking the men of the 6th Wisconsin and the 2nd Wisconsin back there. What did they do for them there? Uh, gathered them in. They could stop the bleeding, apply tourniquets or stop putting lint on the wounds, uh, administer opium and morphine for pain relief. And then they, what they're going to do is call for the ambulances uh, to come into this area uh, and then evacuate these wounded soldiers out of this. This is a lithograph drawing of a, vacu or a field hospital. You can see a surgeon here, a surgeon here, a corps man who has a backpack of supplies, and they're administering to the men pretty much on the battlefield. These were established as close to the battle line as you could get and get protection. And here comes the ambulance. And they're just going to pick up these wounded soldiers and then remove them back to a field hospital uh, where they could get more extensive care. Now, these field hospitals were local, usually located about two, two and a half miles uh, beyond the battle line, uh, outside, uh, off, the, off the battlefield so they wouldn't have artillery fire. Uh, this is the Hoffenberger barn, which was used as headquarters by uh, Hooker during the battle here. This has been all restored. A lot of people think that this is where the, the uh, wounded Union went to. I don't believe it because it's too close to the battle lines and it could take a lot of artillery fire and musket fire here. That's the barn been restored, but this is where uh, Hooker had his headquarters the night of the battle. This is where he directed the, the field of fire. And this is the in, uh, a drawing of the interior of a field hospital. You can see the ambulance out here. They're unloading it. This is the field. Uh, operating table. You got the surgeons working here. You got people in the hayloft in and around uh, either after the amputation and the surgery or uh, waiting. This is some aftermath showing wounded soldiers. Most of them had uh, some kind of an amputation of the arm. Here's a leg. Here's another leg. And they usually put them around a tree. We call this the wounding tree um, where they can get some help there and um, get them out of the shade until they could get evacuated by the ambulances. I firmly believe that the Iron Brigade used this farm as their main hospital uh, during the Battle of the Cornfield. This is the Middlecoff farm. Uh, it's about a half a mile beyond the Poffenberger farm. Uh, the house is original and there's a barn and this picture here, this is original and there's a lake here where they could get a water supply. Uh, this, is all, this is privately owned today. Now, after they're there, then they're going to evacuate them fully out of the battle area, and they're going to use a road that we call the Smoke Town Road. Uh, it's a gravel road that still exists today. Most people don't use it. Uh, on my tours out there, I take people through this because it takes them back in history. And this was a main evacuation route uh, of the ambulances coming from the battlefield and taking the wounded Union soldiers out of the battle area uh, into field hospitals beyond. We have witness trees. There are five witness trees on the battlefield. These are big old trees uh, that were there during the battle. This is right off to the side of the Smoketown Road. You can see the size of this, this oak tree. And we know it by, uh, we measure the girth of that tree and then we know how old it is. So we know that tree, that wasn't as big then, but that was that tree as a seedling or a little tree was there during the battle. So this is a, uh, a witness tree. The wounded are moving, moved back about two miles. Uh, into a little town called Keedysville. Uh, Keedysville is two miles away, and then, uh, Letterman set up some hospitals in the town of Keedysville. Uh, this is a, a plaque that they have showing what Keedysville looked like. And this is a barn. This is a barn that's still there. And I'm going to read a quote to you from a soldier who was in that barn. Let me get my paperwork. Okay, this is Keedysville, September 19th, 1862. Dear brother and sister, although I have written to you since I have received any word from you, I will write a few lines again. You have, of course, heard of the recent battles in this state, and I am anxious to relieve your anxiety concerning me. I am well, with the exception of a slight wound in my left shoulder, which I received at the battle near Sharpsburg the day before yesterday. Since I last wrote to you, I have been 
in two battles, one at the South Mountain near Middletown on Sunday on, through the 18th, and the other at Sharpsburg on Wednesday the 19th. South Mountain, I was not hurt, although I did have many close calls. Our brigade, meaning the Iron Brigade, was nearly annihilated. It's now less than 291 men. Last spring, we numbered over 4,000 men. So after the battles that they've been in, uh, uh, the second Bull Run and, and the Battle of Antietam, um, the, the deaths were great. And the other near Sharpsburg, South Mountain, I was not hurt, uh, but I had some close calls. Uh, I'm in a barn with about 120 wounded men. It's a very good hospital and we have very good care. I am able to wait on myself and help others the same. The wounded far, the wounded far much better there than we did in Virginia after the Battle of the Second Bull Run, for the citizens now turn out and take care of them. There are several ladies here waiting on the helpless now. I have not heard from James since I wrote you before. I don't know what to think about him. I do not wish him to alarm you, but I fear he was wounded worse than I and led to believe. He might have died, but I still hope to hear from him he's safe. So this is a barn where a lot of the Iron Brigade soldiers were brought back in Keedysville and uh, uh, operation surgery was taking place and the men recuperated from here. Now, where are they gonna go from here? This is a German reformed church in Keedysville that was used as a hospital. This is a seminary uh, school, which was used also as a hospital, which is still there. And these are privately owned. And this is a, uh, another hospital site on the banks of the Little Antietam, which is right in front of you. That bridge goes across the Little Antietam, uh, which in about a mile, mile and a half flows into the big Antietam Creek. Uh, so this is a little town of Keedysville, which is a big hospital site. Now from Keedysville, they're gonna be evacuated to Boonesboro, Boonesboro, Maryland. This is a crossroads. That was a hotel, uh, still used as B&B today, but that was a hotel during the battle uh, after South Mountain. In fact, General Lee came through there, General Jackson, uh, and uh, used a hospital site by Confederates after the Battle of South Mountain. So that F, uh, this building still stands there, and that's a crossroads in Boonesboro. From Boonesboro, they're going to go up across the South Mountain. This is Turner's Gap. Uh, off to the left, there's a nice restaurant called the Stone House Inn, uh, and it goes up over, and then they're going to go back down, and then the next stop is going to be Middletown. Middletown's about six miles from Boonesboro. You see a big church in the middle of the, of the photo. And what Letterman did at this church, <laughs> excuse me, the ambulances stopped. And the wounded were taken out of the ambulance, taken inside the church. Their wounds could be redressed. Uh, water was given, maybe some, uh, some food and things like this. So the soldiers were allowed to rest for about six hours. Uh, once they got their strength back up, then they're reloaded into an ambulance, and then they're going to proceed uh, farther than they're going into Frederick. Uh, so Letterman saw this, and he said, these soldiers need rest. You just don't flop them over these roads on there. They're not turnpikes like we have today, uh, but soldiers have needed rest, and this is what uh, Letterman found. And he set these trains up, at, and at certain times, they would move, so he wouldn't get a traffic jam in Middleburg, even with Middletown. He wouldn't have trains coming from uh, Frederick out there and trains from uh, Middletown going to Frederick. So he set them up sort of like a railroad timetable. Now they're moving into uh, Frederick. Uh, this is the Hessian barracks. Hessian barracks were there since the Revolutionary War. And this is hospital number one. Uh, uh, the Union took this over and made a federal hospital out of it. And after the Battle of Antietam, there were 34 general hospitals in the town of Frederick, Maryland. Uh, some of them were churches, some of them were government buildings, some of them private homes and things like this. Uh, but this was a, a hospital in Frederick. This is a, a Lutheran church. Uh, Frederick, his name is the, the city of Spires. There are over six huge churches with big spires. And this is one of the churches that was used, the field hospital. And what's unique about this is this photo. This was taken inside that hospital. Uh, <laughs> the pews were not taken out. You can see there were boards were Went over the pews, and you can see the choir loft kind of close to the men who are sitting, are sitting on their beds there. Um, but this is the only photograph I know of the interior of a, a Union hospital. And this was taken in Frederick after the Battle of Antietam. Uh, and these wounded soldiers are, are convalescing there. And then from here, they're going to be moved probably into other hospitals in Philadelphia, New York City, Washington, D.C., and such. 
Uh, so this was a, a photo taken inside the hospital. Here's my, my hero, Jonathan Letterman. Uh, he served the Union Army from 1862 until he left the Army in 1864. And he's the father of what I call the father of battlefield medicine. Uh, he lived in 1872. Uh, after the war ended, he went out to California uh, with a wife and some children, and, but he didn't last long. He sort of had an intestinal problem. His wife died really early in the conflict of uh, childbirth, and he was never the same after she passed away. And he's passed away and he uh, was buried in San Francisco. He had one daughter. They had two daughters, never, none of them married, but uh, the one daughter became a personal uh, sec a secretary to President Taft in the early 1900s. And she petitioned the president, uh, would you m sign an order bringing my father and my mother back from San Francisco and they could be buried in Arlington Cemetery amongst the men that he had helped. And Taft signed the order, and uh, Letterman and his wife are buried both in, in Arlington Cemetery. This is the back medical evac that we use today so that others may live. That's the only job of medical evacuation. And now we use helicopters and other means to get the wounded off the battlefield. This is a site in Vietnam where we're using helicopters to get into a, in, a position in the jungle to get the wounded out of there. This is what we use today. We got big Apache type uh, uh, military ambulance helicopters and also the uh, track vehicles to get the wounded out of there. And then we use aircraft. The aircraft takes the wounded from the battle area and within hours they're up in Germany uh, to the big hospital in Germany where the major uh, surgeries are taking place. And then after they recover from that, they're put on another aircraft and sent back to the United States. They're either at, uh, in Washington, D.C., at Bethesda, or some of them end up in Texas, some of them on the West Coast. They try to get them back close to their families so their families can come in and see them and kind of give them re recovery. So this is what we use today. All started because of what Letterman did in 1862 at the Battle of Antietam. Uh, started with nothing, uh, and it grew and grew and grew until it, what it is today. But uh, everybody in our country should know what goes on at the battlefield, especially evacuation. Uh, these uh, ambulance corps people, sort of like first responders we're talking about today uh, during our pandemic that we have today, first responders are going out and doing their work. They don't care so much about themselves. Uh, all they wanna do is help other people. So uh, whenever you see a first responder, go up and say, thank you for what you do. That kind of ends my discussion. Uh, if you have questions, we'll go from there.